understanding is that, is that the theme of this year's conference is connectivity or connectedness. Um, and I thought I would, I, I thought about that a bit uh, 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 driving here. <laughs> and I thought, it made me wonder, you know, what, what kind of wisdom could I possibly impart about connecting? I, I think, I presume that we're talking about connecting with readers, which is, as writers is one of the great, great mysteries of our time, right? How do we connect with readers? It's a, you know, it's a big question. It's, it's like one of the great questions of our age, like, you know, who, who built the pyramids? Or why do men like to watch TV with one hand down their shorts? Um, <laughs> ultimately, un unanswerable mysteries. But today, these days, it seems that the answer, the preferred answer is social media, that th this is how we connect with readers. This is a new device, a new technology that will solve the problem. And maybe for some it does. Uh, you know, I, I personally enjoy um, social media, being on, on Twitter. Uh, I get a kick out of it. Um, although sometimes it feels like just another mouth to feed, you know? Um, you know, it's something you have to now do. It's the new minimum. Uh, and it reminds me that, that it may not be as much of an answer as we, we hope it or wish it to be. It makes me think about the last couple of years. What's been the biggest breakout novel of the last two years? It's Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl, right? I mean, it, it's, it's the most overwhelmingly, she, she wasn't, it's not like, she, you know, Gone Girl was in a, you know, a sequence of novels that were all uh, as well received. Gone Girl exploded. Do you know how many followers Gillian Flynn has on Twitter? Zero. Because she's not on Twitter. She's writing a book like Gone Girl. So I think, I think the truth is that you can't tweet your way out of a lousy book. Um, <laughs> So what is there to be done? How do we connect? If, if social media can sometimes feel like, uh, uh, you know, you're throwing pennies and making a wish and throwing pennies into a fountain or buying a scratch and win and publishing a blog, you know, if, if it's just sort of wishful thinking, um, doesn't it, it sometimes feels, it makes us feel powerless, right, to be writers. I mean, I think that is the existential condition of the writer, is one of powerlessness. <laughs> I think we have to embrace that powerlessness. At least, or at least sort of get, our, get a handle on it because it's never going to go away. I mean, think of the rejection. It's just a constant diet of rejection, being a writer. Um, you know, editors pass on our manuscripts. Agents refuse to call us back. Our spouses wish we'd get a real job. Um, everyone has more power. And I mean, everyone has more power than the writer. I, I was recently writing a screenplay, and uh, I, I was given the job and I was, I, was, I was told, oh, you're the only person who can do this and uh, uh, we, we need you, Andrew. And so I went to a meeting after, after I'd submitted my first draft screenplay and the producers were assembled there in this powerful seeming boardroom and everyone was saying, you nailed it. We knew we hired the right guy. You just, this, this is an amazing script. And we went around the, you know, the development guy, yes, and the associate producer, oh, Andrew, you, you, you know, tears were coming certainly to my eyes. Um, and then it came down to the guy, literally the guy, Jason, I remember this guy's name, who was bringing the coffee. He was the intern. He was the unpaid intern. And they said, oh, Jason, you've read it too. What did you think? And he looked around and he said, I, I kind of bumped on the third act. And I thought, okay, so what, Jason? Jason, 22-year-old Sheridan College Jason. Who cares about Jason? <laughs> they cared about Jason. The room stopped. And everyone said, there's a problem. We have a problem. I was like, what do you mean you have a problem? You guys all loved it. <laughs> Jason's the only guy who didn't like it. And then like, yeah, well, mm, J Jason. And they were all listening to Jason. <laughs> no one cared about the writer anymore. Jason has more power than me. The intern has more power than any of us. So, how do we get our power back, right, as writers? And I think it's, it's not about, you know, sort of tweeting more or, or having homicidal dreams about Jason. <laughs> Two things I've done to, and nothing's happened. Um, I think we need to take control of the one thing that we do have at our command, the one thing that is truly ours, and that is our story. It's the story that's ours. 
So how do we make our story pop? If that is the one thing that we can manipulate and nurse and boost and uh, uh, you know, sort of put into therapy and improve, um, how is that done? I think, and this is, I would probably answer this question differently even two years ago, but now I think I'm becoming more convinced that we are in the age of the pitch. And I don't mean just sort of, oh, you mean, yeah, we have workshops for pitches, you know, sort of describing the book that you already have in better ways. I mean pitch in the sense of thinking of your story in a fundamentally new way. Ideally, thinking about it even before you begin the book and really asking yourself, what is this story about, right? It's the most fundamental question. People ask, oh, you're a writer? Yeah, what's your story about? You'd think that would be an easy question to answer. It's actually extremely difficult. It's the only time I wish I was a lawyer, <laughs> which I was trained to do. The only time I wish I was a lawyer is when I'm in a, like an airport terminal or sitting beside someone and they say, oh, you're a writer, what's your book about? <laughs> you know, no one asks a lawyer what, you know, what's your lawyering about. Um, but honestly, I really do believe that the most important 300 words that you will write for your book won't be in the book. It will be the covering letter. It will be that query email. And I don't, again, I don't just mean that in terms of like trying to sell your book. I'm not just talking about pitching in the sense of marketing. I mean, for you, the most important document that you will write perhaps only in your head will be, what is my book about? What is my pitch? I'll tell you that, and why I wouldn't answer the question the same way two years ago is because two years ago I didn't have my current editor, and her name is Sarah Knight. At, si at Simon and & Schuster. And she signed me for The Demonologist, which is already done. We edited the book together. And then she signed me for two more books. And so uh, we had a conversation early on. She asked, you know, what's, what's the book that you want to write next? What's it about? And I told her. Because up until that point, I had done what probably all of us assume writers do, that you just kind of go away into the wilderness and write your book. And then you eventually come back sort of bearded and stumbling. <laughs> And, and so here it is. And the world either accepts it or declines it, but that is the book. And uh, she said, so I explained it, and I sort of, as a courtesy, I'll tell you what the new book is about. And she said, said mm, there's a long pause, and she said, what else you got? <laughs> I, and I thought, what else you got? I mean, I mean th this, you know, I was like, who, who do you think you are? I know, she's not even 30, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what else you got? So I got off the phone, I was, I was just, uh, uh, I, I was shocked, and I was, you know, it was like Sarah and Jason, I wanted them both dead. <laughs> um, but I did go away, and I sort of thought, well, all, all right, I aim to please, I'm a team player, maybe, she, you know, there's maybe some fraction of her comment that is correct. So I fashioned a whole different idea, and I got on the phone, I was like, okay, here it is. New idea, boom. And she's like, hmm, not feeling it. <laughs> so I, you know, I thought, not feeling it. I wanted to do something that she would feel. Uh, so I tried again. Okay, Sarah, here's, you know, I was bringing in aliens and, uh, uh, you know, eventually I kind of threw out a whole bunch of ideas. She's like, that, there's something there. There's something there. So I fashioned this idea, and it ended up being uh, a book that, I'm, that I've now completed and that I really, really loved, and I really enjoyed working on it. And so the long story is that Sarah was right. I was wrong. Sarah was right. That to think about the book in advance is that's the most valuable time, because you, it, there's nothing to fix. It's not broken. Fixing a book is so much harder than thinking of the book uh, in advance in a way that excites you. Because that's what the pitch is about. It's not about taking a book that exists and trying to convince something that it's something that it isn't. It's thinking of the book yourself, pitching yourself to devise a story that excites you. Because there's too often, we, we think of our stories as though it's kind of a ball and chain. You know, it's like, no, that's the story. I'd love to make it more interesting, <laughs> but I simply can't. I take your point about selling it and having people liking it, but <laughs> this is my story. Uh, it's, it's sort of dull in its own personal way. 
The story can be changed. That's, think of it as a pitch. It's a very elastic thing. No one says you're on this course and it's just a matter of trying to tweet people into liking it. It's, it's an elastic thing. That's what's wonderful about it. It's a story. You can make things up. You can change it. So I, I urge you to perfect your pitch. And again, not just in terms of trying to sell someone on it, but trying to sell yourself on it. Because I really believe that if you can't convince someone in 30 seconds that this is something that's interesting. It just won't work on the page. So I'm going to very, very quickly go through uh, what I think are the elements of a good pitch. Um, and they are, to my mind, they number certainly four, if not five, ingredients. Um, first is a title. Second is a protagonist. Third is a premise, or what, what Hollywood and, and New York and everywhere is increasingly calling high concept. It's the same thing. High concept, two words, premise one. Currently, we, pre we prefer two words. <laughs> Four, stakes. And fifth is optional in terms of the pitch, because you can work this out or not. Uh, sometimes it's more crucial, a resolution, the ending. Um, so very quickly, first, title. Titles are hugely important. You sort of think, yeah, but that's something you kind of tack on at the end, right? I mean, the story is separate from the title. I, I don't think so. I think a title is, it's evocative and it's useful for you. It's what is this story about in its smallest kernel? A title has power and it's empowering to give something a name, your book a name. It makes it more real immediately. Sort of, so if it's just like, you know, this is the novel about my grandmother and her journey, it's like, <laughs> but if you call it journey, okay, I'm listening. Um, so don't, don't neglect, don't leave the title to the end. Give, it, give the thing a title at the beginning, and it, it immediately assumes a personality. Second, protagonist. Your protagonist is your way in, right? Your, your protagonist is the person who sees the story. It's your point of view. It's their nose you'll be smelling with. It's their eyes you're seeing with. And a, a, a sort of a, a key, I think, to, to, to knowing that you have your protagonist right, uh, right enough that you can be in writing, is do you know your protagonist's secret? I, I always wait until I know what their secret is. And that's not, to me, that's not to say that this is a secret that they will reveal in the story. It may be something that you will never learn, the reader will never learn about your protagonist, but do you know what their secret is? Because when you think of, when you think of your own life, right, well, we all have some secret that always is kind of bubbling away at the back of our mind. It defines us. It's the thing that we most want no one else to know, but we do. And every exchange, every time we shake a hand, every time we clink a glass, every time we talk to that person next to us on the flight, our secret is there. I hope they don't look, are, you, are they looking at my nose? Because I, I've always been self-conscious about my nose because my brother broke my nose and I hated my brother but then he died in that car accident and I feel terrible about it and that's why I don't want them to look at my nose. <laughs> the nose is everything, right, in this particular case. Do you know what the equivalent of your protagonist's nose is? You have to before you start writing and you have to in the pitch. Tell us in the pitch what their secret is, what makes them interesting. High concept or premise, this is crucial, right? I, I, you know, like it or not, publishing today, you cannot, you cannot get published, really, essentially, unless your writing is just so persuasively beautiful. And I don't even think that matters to the same degree it, it used to. You have to have a premise that's engaging, it, or you will not be published. It's the end of the story. Um, and by a premise, I don't mean idea. I think sometimes people can, can think, oh yeah, you mean like, um, my story is about memory. No, 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 that's a theme. There's no story that's ever been written about memory that in and of itself is sufficiently interesting. So I'll give you an example. What's the difference between an idea and a premise? Well, an idea might be a, oh, I, I'm thinking of a contemporary retelling of Frankenstein. That's an idea but it's not a premise. A premise or high concept will be, would be dinosaur DNA is discovered and new dinosaurs are replicated from that DNA. And these dinosaurs are put on an island where they are put in cages so people can visit them. The dinosaurs get out. 
Jurassic Park. That pitch is, is interesting, right? Oh, you have the hook of they have a technology that can recreate living dinosaurs. You have the setup of they, they are put in a, uh, a resort, a zoo. The dinosaurs get out. Your idea of like, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, dinosaurs and DNA, mm, that's an idea. The second part is a premise, and it tells something that you're immediately interested in, right? The premise for Jurassic Park is, even if Jurassic Park itself is not a, uh, uh, a brilliant book or, or well-executed <laughs> book, the premise is quite beautiful. Um, and just in case you're thinking, well, no, that, that, that's just a commercial example, right? High concept doesn't apply to literary writing. You're wrong. Think about, think about this. An idea might be a book about snipers in World War I. You might think, that's what my book is about. My book is about, it's a history about snipers in World War I. But that's only an idea. A, a, a compelling high concept would be a book about two native brothers, Canadian, who joined the war. And they turn out to be, both of them, the best snipers in the war. So that's high concept, right? That's Three Day Road by Joseph Boyden, a literary novel. It has a high concept and a premise that is immediately engaging and involving. Because it's not just about two guys who join the war. They are the best. They're outsiders, they're native, and they're the best snipers of the First World War. That elevates it. That elevates the story on the level of pitch. Finally, stakes, right? Um, really, it's, it's crucial when you're thinking about your story to answer the question sufficiently to yourself, why do I care? Why, should, why would anyone care about this story? If your answer is, because I care, <laughs> you have a problem. You, think about, for example, you know, the, the Rob Ford story, right? Um, which is ongoing. It's, it's useful to think about Rob Ford. Well, that's not even true. That's not true. <laughs> but for the sake of this exercise, I'm going to ask you to think about Rob Ford. And, and his story can go in very, various ways, right? Is it a story about could he come back and win the election? Is it a story about a city that has suffered under the regime of a, of a monster, a Godzilla, and will the city survive? Is it a story of the wife, long-suffering perhaps, or Lady Macbeth? Uh, who is she? Um, will she escape? Will she manipulate Macbeth successfully? Or the children, will they survive? It, where you put the stakes of the story in the Rob Ford case, you might think, oh, it's a story about Rob Ford and this happens, this happens, this happens. No, you have to make a decision. What is the Rob Ford story about? Why do you care? Make me care about where you put your bet. Where do you place your bet? That's what stakes are. You have to decide and stick to it, right? This story is really about this. And the cost is what would happen to this character if things go wrong or if it explodes or uh, if he's reelected, which is equal to an explosion. So focus on the cost of your protagonist. What could she or he lose? And finally, a resolution. Um, I th it, this is not necessary uh, um, uh, to have in your pitch. It might be very useful to you, though, unless there's a twist, unless there's something like, no, the, the, I know what the ending is, and it's really cool because you think it's going one way, and then it goes another. So in that case, it's, it's, it's useful to know your ending, uh, but not, not necessary. Sometimes you can discover that. Um, so I'll end there, because, and I just I want to have time for maybe a, a question or two, uh, if there is time. But um, I, I really do believe that connectivity, connecting with readers, and regaining the power we can so often feel like we, we lose as writers, or maybe never had. Never forget that it's not manipulating a marketplace, or trying to get an agent, or uh, all of the racket aspect of it. It's your story is the only thing that is inarguably yours. And the story is the only thing you can change. Thank you.